Our gospel lesson this morning comes from John, the second chapter. It is the famous water into wine story from the wedding at Cana. Listen for God's word for you. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, they don't have any wine. And Jesus replied, woman, what does that have to do with me? My time hasn't come yet. His mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby, there were jars used for the Jewish cleansing ritual, each able to hold about 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw, from, draw some from them and take it to the head waiter. And they did. And the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine. He didn't know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The head, wa- the head waiter called the groom and said, everyone serves the good wine first. They bring out the second rate wine only when the guests are drinking freely. You kept the good wine until now. This was the first miraculous sign that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. The word of the Lord. All right, so the weirdest wedding I have ever done took place on Halloween. And it was about 10 years ago, and it took place in an old rundown bank lobby. I'm I'm not making any of this up, 100% truthful. I conducted the opening ceremony in the entryway of the old vault in the lobby of this bank. The groom wore a kilt and was played down the aisle with a bagpiper. His fiance was dressed as Cinderella. She was bagpiped down as well. Attendees were encouraged to forego their typical formal wear and wear costumes or Halloween-themed outfits, and boy, did everyone go for it. The food spread. It was actually set up in the vault. The beverages were served out of a coffin filled with ice. The lovely couple's name, Charles and Diana. The groom, a neurology student in residence, decorated each table with a pumpkin, and on each pumpkin, he carved an MRI cross-section of a patient who had multiple sclerosis. I'm not making this up. It really was that odd. The wedding, it went off without a hitch. The bagpiper played his pipes. The vows were said. We all did the monster mash. It was actually a lot of fun. We didn't run out of wine. We didn't run out of food. We didn't run out of Halloween candy. It was Perfect, but man, planning uh, weddings, it is stressful, am I right? That stress, it's like a virus, it infects anyone who dares draw near to the planning process. There are so many things, in a spirit of honesty, there are so many things me and most ministers I know would rather do than a wedding, because everything has to be perfect, And that's just not the case with worship services or baptisms or memorial services. Every wedding, it has this funny little stage show that myself and the wedding perform. Okay, you stand here, you escort, you hold the boat. Who's got the ring? Who's doing the ring? Oh, don't tell me you're going to do the thing with the dog being the ring bearer. That's ridiculous. It never works. At least put some fake rings on the dog. Put the real ones in your pocket in case Biscuit decides he can't handle the pressure and is going to make a run for the door or deposits his wedding present to you somewhere near the altar. Weddings are high stress. No one walks away unscathed. And with each new wedding, I come a little bit more convinced because I have this sneaking suspicion that weddings might just be an elaborate scheme to trick everyone into getting dressed up to take really nice photos. Because that's what it seems to be all about these days. But don't worry, don't worry. If I've ever conducted your wedding or if I have agreed to do your wedding in the future, I'm not talking about you. (laughs) Your wedding was perfect. A walk in the park, planned to perfection. I have never met a couple so relaxed and so prepared. From the time time I graduated seminary and college, and it was about the time that my friends started getting married. I had some of those friends that got married very young, just right out of school. And from then to now, I feel like weddings have been stuck in this never-ending arms race. Most of those first weddings took place in a church. They were super simple. There was a short reception afterwards in the gym that had some punch and a cake. They had candelabras like this, lots of brass everywhere. And the receptions were just incredibly simple. 
But nowadays, nobody gets married in a church, or hardly anyone does. Nowadays, you find 20 or 30-somethings roaming the hills and forests in search of dilapidated barns or hidden wineries to get married at. It's like Field of Dreams. If you got an old farm, and I'm honest business advice here, if you have an old farm with a barn, just say it's a wedding venue and people will just start showing up. And the decor, it's now natural beauty. The summer heat or whatever wild animals walk through the ceremony. Nobody is doing the unity candle anymore. Now we got the unity sand, the unity blending of wine, the unity painting, the unity hand fasting, unity tree planting, unity time capsule, unity clog making. It's this old Dutch tradition where a couple makes their partner a pair of those weird Dutch wooden clogs right in the middle of service. The trick is you have to have a large portion of them already crafted so it doesn't take, you know, like more than 15 minutes in the service. I just made that one up. That's totally not a thing. I would love to attend that ceremony, though. Do you know, as of 2018, the average American wedding, want to guess what it cost? $33,391. People in here with daughters just started sweating, including myself. You know, and this is the thing, it's based on the average engager. The engager ring is included in that. And they say the average engagement ring is $6,163. What are people buying? So now we, we don't have churches. We have these unique, expensive venues. We don't just serve cake and punch. We have whole meals with open bars and live bands that play well past midnight. We're paying thousands of dollars for photographers and videographers to get that perfect set of pictures that we can share on Instagram to prove that this was the best day ever. We got engagement parties and bridal showers, and now we have parties to reveal who's in the wedding party. And then it comes to the bachelor and bachelorette parties, which now are becoming these multi-day excursions costing an average, I'm not making this up, $1,532 per person. There's a part of you at the tail end of college that just hopes to God you don't have a lot of friends because you are going to be poor over the next 10 years. In the spirit of honesty, Ashley and I are not immune to some elements of this arms race. We try to be as frugal as possible within our plans, but we didn't have bachelor or bachelorette parties. But we did have our wedding on a farm. Outdoors, the mountains were around us. We did have live music. We had a full dinner, a cow mooed through the majority of our ceremony. It poured rain on everyone the moment we were pronounced man and wife. We didn't, run out of, we didn't run out of wine, but we did run out of cheer wine because most of our friends were from the Midwest and didn't realize it was soda. And so they all grabbed a can thinking it was literally canned wine and started taking pictures with it. As crazy as our weddings have got as a culture, we are still getting off a little bit light compared to the cultural norms of Jesus' day. Throwing a wedding meant having a week-long party for your whole town. So maybe it wouldn't mean you were throwing a party for all of Kingsport, but it would certainly mean seven days of party for your neighborhood or your village and all your family and friends. So obviously this would be incredibly expensive. But that was the cultural expectation. And it would have been a social disaster to not fulfill them. People had these clever ways of bringing down the cost of these large extravaganzas. You'd spare no expense on that first day. The best food, the best wine, the best music, the best atmosphere. But people had busy lives. And most people didn't attend all seven days. So the meals each subsequent day got a little smaller, a little less extravagant. The party got a little less wild. The head waiter of these parties was sort of your co-conspirator, had these ingenious ways of keeping the cost down. You serve your best wine, the vintage you expense for right there on that first day, the one that people drink slowly and sip to savor the flavor. But with each subsequent day and as each party grew longer, the wine got switched out for a lower quality wine. The head waiter would change that wine that they were serving in the middle of the party. 
Start you off with the good stuff, but notice as people threw a few back, they'd switch it out for the cheaper wine. Because no one's going to be able to tell the difference after a while. And you follow this pattern for each subsequent day. You're going to save yourself a little money over the course of a week. A little bit cheaper each day, a little bit less, a little bit less. The story of Jesus' miracle is important to remember. It didn't take place on the first day of the wedding. It took place on the third day. Now, whether it literally took place on that day or not, but we certainly say three. That's a significant date as Christians, right? It's meant to echo the understanding of our resurrection. And so we're no longer seeing the best food. Decent food, decent wine, but it's not the best food. It's not the biggest crowds. It's not the most festive atmosphere. And yet, already, they've run out of wine. They're not even halfway through the wedding festival. They're getting there, but they're not even there yet. It's going to crush the host. It's going to be this enormous embarrassment for the family lasting for years. We don't really know anything about who this family is, but it seems Mary was the point of contact. That's the way Scripture at least seems to set it up. And Jesus and his disciples just scored the invite because of her. Mary is close enough to the host, close enough to the preparations, that she's the one that notices they're about to run out of wine. She's concerned. She doesn't want them embarrassed. She's their friend. It makes sense because that would be embarrassing for the couple, for the families. They're not even halfway there. And somehow they're out? And here is where today's text, I think, gets so interesting. Up until this point, we have seen no indication that Jesus is a miracle worker. Remember, we've talked about that before a couple weeks ago, this, these years of silence in the Jesus stories. And Mary seems to indicate that Jesus has the ability to fix this. And so she goes directly to him. She doesn't send a servant to a nearby vineyard, which would be kind of the practical thing. She doesn't go around to the neighbors asking if they could share some wine. No, she goes right to her son, Jesus. And how does he respond? By seemingly dismissing her. Her concern. Our translation says, woman, what do you want me to do? Which sounds very dismissive. But if you would look at the original text, it's, that's kind of the traditional response of confusion. But Mary persists, but eventually gets up and she just walks off. I think you could interpret it almost as a huff. Do whatever he says to do. It appears that Mary's persistence had an effect, had an effect on Jesus. It wore him down. It got him to change his plans. And the servants followed Jesus' instructions. Did you catch how big those jars were? 20 to 30 gallons, a jar, six of them. So Jesus instructs 120 to 180 gallons of water to be turned into wine. This would have had to take an enormous amount of time to fill those up with water, to carry it back and forth. They probably wouldn't even carried the vase. They probably just would have carried buckets. It would have taken forever. But he turned all that into wine. And I love that sense of surprise in the head waiter. Because remember, the head waiter's there with the family, helping them try to save some money on this thing. And he goes to the groom, almost as though he's confused. Why would you wait until we're halfway through this festival when people have already had the good wine? Why would you wait till now to bring out the best? This doesn't make any sense. You should be serving the cheap stuff. Nobody's going to taste this. Why such extravagance? And I think that is the word of the story, extravagance. That's what this story is all about. Receiving God's extravagance and responding in celebration. And doing all that in a situation of scarcity. It's a incredibly difficult in our lives this business of holding up God's promises of abundance and extravagance in the midst of loss and need and scarcity. It's easy to find ourselves in the situation like Mary and only seeing water. There's no wine to celebrate. There's no party. It's just a party that's ending because all we have is water. Our lives can be dominated by chronic illnesses or physical or emotional pain. We can struggle with finances that just cause us enormous amounts of stress. We can be worn down by systemic injustice. I've always found this helpful practice when I read stories to try to 
find which character do I see myself as in the story? Which character do I identify? In this story, I think the easiest one is to identify with Mary. We see the problems in the world around us. They're pretty obvious to us. And they're just seem, there just doesn't seem to be enough to go around. We feel like we're always on the cusp of failure or humiliation embarrassment. And so we bring those concerns to the one who we believe has the power and the will to right the wrongs and rid our lives of this sense of scarcity. And just like Mary, we too can often feel a little bit of resistance from God to our pleas. What are we to make of Jesus's resistance to Mary's pleas? Scholars call this the scandal of divine indifference. And it's certainly a feeling we are familiar with. It's the language we see in the Psalms. God, where are you? I feel like I'm in this pit all alone. I need your love to save me. God, listen to my cry. Listen to my prayer. Listen to the words spoken from my lips. I cry out to you. Turn your ear to me. God, I take refuge in you. Please never put me to shame. Rescue me. By your righteousness, listen closely to me, deliver me quickly, be a rock and protect me, be strong like a fortress and save me. And the good news is that Jesus appears to be swayed. Jesus tells his mother, Mom, what are you even asking me to do? This isn't the right time. There are other, better ways to start my ministry. I had other plans, godly plans where I do things on my time and in my way. Saving a friend's neck to fix a snafu in wedding planning, man, of all the needs for a miracle in this world, you'd have to rank this as one of the least significant. And yet, Jesus changes his plans. He changes his timeline and takes this tiny moment of scarcity, seemingly won the day and caused panic and worry, and he used it to demonstrate the core truth about the gospel. It's the same truth he would later communicate to the woman at the well that he shares in the story of the Bible. It's the truth that he ultimately in his own death and resurrection that God's love is extravagant. It's abundant, it's overwhelming, it's unexpected. When God comes in mercy, it's more than we could ever need. He didn't need to take six jars and turn them into the urgent need outside of embarrassment. He didn't need to do this to accomplish his mission. It was a completely unnecessary miracle in the grand scheme of God saving humankind. And that is exactly the point. He changed his mind, he changed his plans to demonstrate that God's love is wasteful in coming to save us. God's love is extravagant. It is more than we could ever need to live to receive mercy. If God would change water, our water into wine. To save us, to recreate us, to fill us with abundant amounts of life. I think sometimes the church has forgotten this little story just because it's weird and it doesn't make sense, but we've also forgotten forgotten the spirit of it. The Lord once attended a wedding feast. And yes, gladness and joy, they are so important I'm going to perform a miracle to ensure they happen. And as a church, we've forgotten to live the joy of that revelation. That sign at that wedding in Cana tells us that God wants to put joy in life. God thinks a miracle, a party is so important that God and Jesus will perform a miracle. He thinks celebration is so important that he will change his mind, change his schedule. 
It reminds me of that famous quote from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, a question that we answer found in our prayer confession, a question that forms the foundation of who we are as a people, who we are as a denomination. Humanity's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy God forever. God does not want our religion to be too holy, to be The point of this whole thing is joy and is celebration. Throughout his life, Jesus of Nazareth celebrated people, people getting married, people being healed, people eating meals together. Wherever he went, he brought with him a spirit of celebration as he proclaimed God's mercy and peace and joy. And at that joyous feast in Cana, it's still there as a sign to the church that we are to rejoice in the people of God, to toast the world with the amazing good news of grace. This is called Cana grace, the type of grace which seeps into our sin, causing us to be preoccupied with throwing parties and sharing food and creating an atmosphere of celebration and laughter. It's the type of a church to become obsessed with welcoming the stranger, helping people young and old to find well-being, demonstrating love, and joy to all who would walk in our doors. We ought to be celebrating constantly. We ought to be preoccupied with parties and banquets and feasts and merriment. I'm not talking about that figuratively. I mean that literally. We should be celebrating, not in our minds, but with our whole beings, literally celebrating constantly. We ought to give our whole lives over to the celebration because we have been liberated from the fear of life and the fear of death. And this good news to you today is not a sticky note. It's not a subtle text message. It's not a whisper in your ear. It is a bullhorn to you calling you to come to the party, to live a life full of celebration. So don't walk away from worship today unchanged. That's why we here. That's why in the back glasses grape juice is to remind you rich so you don't walk away today unchanged as a congregation, as individuals, as leaders, as session members, as fellow sisters and brothers in Christ. God is calling you to the party. So how can we share that sense of celebration with new members and new attendees? How can we become a church that's known because it laughs together and plays together and celebrates together this type of Cana grace? How can we demonstrate God's extravagant love to this world? May God fill our hearts with so much joy we cannot help but celebrate. Amen.